Well, this Sunday is Easter Sunday, and it is always an awesome Sunday here at Calvary where we'll be getting ready, and uh, we expect anywhere from 1,200 plus to be walking through our doors, and uh, we know the music's going to be great, and the presence of the Lord's going to be awesome, and the Lord's given me a word to share, so it's, it's going to be a great, great day. I love Easter Sunday. I love every Sunday, but I love, I love Easter Sunday especially. And so we're going to be having a great, great time. Bring somebody with you. Uh, they'll find the place warm and inviting and friendly. And bring somebody with you Easter Sunday morning uh, here at Calvary. It's going to be awesome. After the cleansing of Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5 and the cursing of Gehazi, his servant. You remember that Naaman's leprosy came upon Gehazi when Gehazi decided that he would step outside of the parameters that Elisha had drawn. He entered into a little bit of deception, and the judgment of God fell upon him. But after all of this, we are given a few more stories, and the stories are set here so that we have a full understanding of Elisha and his power. This periscope is given to us in the middle of the histories here. And uh, we've been kind of laying the, just kind of laying the backdrop of King uh, Ben-Hadad or Ben-Hadad, depending on how you want to pronounce it, the king of Syria in the north, he is going to be a nemesis that we're going to be dealing with as the Assyrian empire begins to rise up. That empire is going to be surpassed by a greater empire, and Israel is going to fall. All of that's coming here in, in fast order, because we're now in the mid-800s, 800 or so B.C., in the time period we're dealing with, and the northern kingdom of Israel disappears completely in 722 B.C. So we're moving into that period of time where these evil kings are ultimately going to lead the people to a point where God takes his hand off, allows the Assyrian Empire, the northern empires, to come in, the Babylonians actually, but to come in and, and uh, ultimately destroy them. The Neo-Babylonians ult- ultimately destroy them. But uh, we're, we're dealing with these stories that are taken from um, Elisha's prophetic ministry. And as I've explained before, you'll find that God speaks to Israel and works through Israel through three legs on a piano stool, so to speak. You've got the prophets, you've got the kings, and you've got the priests. When the priesthood and the kingdom and the prophets were all functioning in harmony, Israel had it really good. You'll find this under King David, and you'll find it, we get close to it under Hezekiah, but generally what you'll find is that one of these, just one of these legs is holding up the house of Israel because the other two are corrupt. What you have in, uh, in the years in, under the, uh, what, what's known as the Omri dynasty, where you've got these kings like Joram, we're dealing with him right now, the kingdom is so corrupt and the priesthood is somewhat corrupted and, and divorced, God raises up strong, strong prophets because he still has a plan that he's working out for Israel. Even today, God still has a plan that he's working out in Israel. They're in the news every day they should be. They're a part of the way that God is wrapping up his, his entire plan for all of the earth. We go all the way back now to these rebellious ultra-rebellious people in the northern sector called Israel, and we're dealing with 2,700 years ago now, we look at these people and we say, why didn't God just utterly destroy them and wipe them off of the face of the earth? Because God had a plan that he was working out step by step, and strong prophets were all a part of that. So, to set the stage, We're going to be dealing tonight completely with the northern kingdom of Israel that has its headquarters or its capital city in Samaria. The the king is Joram, and he is a a grandson of Ahab. You have also a strong prophet named Elisha. We're looking into his stories and, and how God used him in miraculous ways. And then to the north, you have the kingdom that is known biblically as Aram. It's modern-day Syria. And this kingdom of Aram becomes, and the Arameans, they become a major problem for Israel. So that kind of sets the stage and the players. We're going to bypass one of the stories simply because there are so many stories here. It would would divorce us further and further from the geopolitics that we've been trying to unload in this study for the last year. 
So we're going to bypass the axe head floating story. Maybe we'll get, that to a, we'll get to that to another time. But we're going to pick up the delightful story that follows it, and that is in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 23. 2 Kings 6, 8 through 23. The story begins with the word once. You're reading along through history, and then it says, once this happened, it simply tells you that the, his, the uh, what should I call them, the archivist, or whoever it is who has drawn all of this material together that we have in Second Kings. Remember, we don't know who wrote Second Kings, we don't know who wrote First Kings or First and Second Chronicles. Uh, these come out of the archives and the gatherings of all of the writings of Israel. But whoever is gathering all this together is not putting here a hard timeline on. In some areas in Kings and Chronicles and First and Second Samuels, you've got a timeline. This happened and then this happened and this happened. And you can follow a very tight timeline. But when you get to these periscopes where suddenly we're given stories of the prophets We don't have a real tight chronology, so we don't know exactly where all of these things fit in. This story very well could have occurred before Naaman. It could have occurred after. It was probably after Naaman, but it could have occurred after Naaman. We're just not given a hard place where we can set it time-wise. Let's pick up our reading in verse 8. And what I'm going to do tonight is rather than read the entire passage at once, We'll take it kind of paragraph by paragraph and then bring commentary into play so that you can understand what's going on. In verse 8, once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, at such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he was used to warn him so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. Now, what we have in this situation is kind of interesting as best we can piece it together. Syria and Israel are living in in a state of undeclared war. There is an ongoing border incursion. The same type of thing you'll find Uh, In a couple of weeks, many of us will be over in Israel, and you're going to find yourself there. I don't want to frighten anybody, but you find yourself surrounded by all of these nations, and all of the borders are uneasy, always. They always have been. They always have been. But in this day, you had Aram in the north, or Syria in the north, and Israel just below her, and over the borders, there were these constant, constant incursions. Ben-Hadad, who was the king of Syria... He had designs on the land of Israel. He wanted to conquer the land of Israel, but he was being very careful. And so what he would do is he would would send out raiding parties. And this type of thing was going on all of the time. And as best we can piece together, as they are living in this uneasy peace with the the, problems that they're having in the borderlands, Ben-Hadad becomes aware that Israel's intelligence is far superior to anything he has ever encountered before. Joram is no righteous king in Israel. He's wicked. But God is for Israel because God has made covenant and a plan, and he's working it out. And so God is for Israel, and through his servant, through Elisha the prophet, he operates the most effective spy network the world has ever seen. Imagine if the Lord were to give us in the United States the same kind of intelligence that he gave to Israel through Elisha. Imagine if we, imagine if we possessed by prophetic utterance that the government would listen to. Imagine if we possessed perfect intelligence on ISIS, ISIL, Iran, Iraq, northern Pakistan, can you, um, Yemen, can you imagine if right now we had absolute perfect intelligence? I- imagine if we knew what was going on in the mind of Mad Vlad, if we knew what was going on in the mind of Vladimir Putin in Russia. Not just what he's doing politically, but imagine if we knew what he was thinking, exactly what he was thinking. 
Imagine that kind of intelligence. Imagine if we were suddenly privy to the economic plans and military designs in Beijing. Imagine if we had intelligence on every bit of cyber spying that's going on within the, the military industrial complex, if we had full knowledge of all of those things, and if suddenly we were made completely aware with absolute certainty that what we know is true. Can you imagine how powerful that information would be? Joram, because of Elisha, Joram acted on perfect intelligence. One of the keys to running a good spy operation is hiding the fact that you know exactly what's going on. In other words, your intelligence can be so good that it gives up the source that you're getting it from. So in intelligence services, they are always fighting this battle whereby the highest level of intelligence they can possibly achieve, that's what they want, but they have to be careful what they do with that intelligence so that they don't expose the source, so that the golden goose can keep laying the golden eggs. And that's always a problem. In the Second World War, you may have heard the, the name before of the Enigma machine. That was the way, it was a, a coding machine that they used to encipher and decipher messages. Germans used it. And it was a, it was a fantastic a development for its day. Enigma uh, was broken first by by uh, three Polish cryptologists, and they were, able to, they were able to figure out partially what the Enigma messages were saying. And, and so early on in the war, Germany's communications weren't nearly as secure as they thought they were, to a certain degree. But in 1944, something really interesting happened when, US, when, when the U.S. Navy disabled a German submarine, the U-505, and when they disabled her and destroyed her ability to communicate with, with Germany, Germany thought she was sunk. And so the U.S., being pretty crafty, towed, they towed her and her crew to Bermuda. And uh, in Bermuda, the crew was offloaded, and they were shipped to Louisiana. And they were deprived of all of their POW rights as far as, not as far as treatment is concerned, but as far as the Red Cross or notification of Germany that they had been take, taken captive. Why did we not notify Germany, as were the protocols of the war, that these men were taken captive? Because of what was on the U-boat. U-505 had an Enigma machine, a German authentic Enigma machine, and all of the manuals and all of the deciphering pads, all of that was intact, and we captured it in 1944. And suddenly, at a place called Bletchley Square, in London, suddenly, as we shared this intelligence, the Brits were able, and we were able to capitalize on it as being their allies, but the Brits were able to listen into, with almost perfection, the war plans of the Germany, which hastened uh, the war plans of Germany, which really hastened uh, the end of the war. English and American spy masters then were able to reroute. They routed themselves, they routed the shipping away from German U-boats. They, they routed our uh, destroyers and our hunters into the places where the German, German U-boats were. And beyond all of that, there was a lot of other data that was, uh, that was open to them. So it substantially changed the game. Now Joram didn't play, cat, he didn't play this cat and mouse game. What he did, uh, being somewhat less sophisticated than later warriors. Joram, when Elisha would tell him what God said, he responded immediately. And when, when Ben-Hadad's troops would get moved, they'd find Israel there camped where they wanted to camp or waiting for them or holding the high ground. Every military maneuver that they undertook, the Israelis were already far, far ahead of them. It became very, very frustrating to the point where Ben-Hadad is convinced, he's convinced that there is a spy in his court. Verse 11, we pick up the reading. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, O Lord, uh, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. 
while this reading has a very, very civil uh, sense and feel to it, remember a historian is giving us uh, an overview. You can be assured that in the court in the courtroom of the uh, or in the throne room with the court of the Syrian king, you can be absolutely sure that he didn't just say, "Will you show me who of us is for the king of Israel?" That's the gist. The bottom line would have been this. I want you to expose the mole. I want you to expose who they are. I want you to bring them to me and I'll kill them. That's the way they did business. And the servants, obviously the servants of of Ben-Hadad had their own sources in Israel. And before long, they're able to come back to the king. It's like a spy novel. They're able to come back to the king and say, bottom line is this, there is a prophet down there in Israel He's the one who goes to the king, and he's able to tell him everything. He's got perfect intelligence on you. And so Syria knows now that their problem is Elisha. You would think that they would back up and say, well, Elisha being the servant of Israel's God, if their God is telling them even our troop movements, Maybe we should just settle down and back down. But that's not the view of these kings in those days. These kings believed that not in just a god or the god of all gods. or Je- They had no sense of Jehovah. Their entire sense of, is every nation has its own gods. Everybody worships their own gods. The gods are territorial. And so the Syrians, their mindset is we have our gods, they have their gods. Down in Jerusalem, they've got their gods. In Moab, in Edom, they've all got their gods. And we're not going to stop fighting with each other because everyone has their gods. We just have to figure out how to get around those gods or to get over on those gods or to show them somehow that our God is greater or stronger than their gods. And you see this throughout the Old Testament. The pagan nations are often talking about the gods of the valleys or the gods of the mountains or the this god is stronger than that god. They live in this deception that there is more than one god and that it's regional and it's territorial and they're, they're all fighting and squabbling among themselves. So they don't give up the idea of conquest over another nation because that, nation, that nation's god is having a good day. They simply step back for a little bit and look for some way to exploit the whole thing. And as Ben-Hadad steps back, he decides, he takes a very, very bold step. And he said, this is verse 13, go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. If the prophet's the problem, he's not going to kill the prophet. He's going to go seize the prophet. Again, this is not uncommon in the Old Testament. We find it with Balaam, who was a seer, or one who, could, who would at times hear from God. Remember Balaam? Balak comes along, and he wants victory over Israel, and so he knows that Balaam has some insight into Israel and Israel's God. So he goes to, Balak and he, he goes to Balaam, and he wants to hire him. It's the same idea. What I'll do is I'll go seize the prophet, I'll make a deal with the prophet, The prophet then will be able to manipulate or appease or sacrifice to or something, but he'll be able to frustrate the work of their God and then I'll be able to get what I want. And so that's his that's his plan, not to go kill Elisha, but to seize him, take him back to Damascus, rehabilitate him, use him for his own ends. And so they come back and they tell him, Behold, he is in Dothan. So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and they surrounded the city. What an incredible story. I would would love to know more. It's at times like this that I'm frustrated with the fact that we're just given these periscopes into these little historical situations because for them to move a large expeditionary force deep into Israel, all in, into Israel, all the way down to Dothan, which was just 10 miles from Samaria, the capital city, for them to be able to move that kind of an armed force and not be detected and not send off the alarms and not have the army marching out of Samaria against them, it was a coup. It was a major stealth deal here. 
Somehow they're able to get their army in place, and it was about a hundred miles from Damascus to Dothan. Now about half or, or even more of that distance, as much as 60 miles of that distance, they would have been in their own country, so they would have been okay. But as soon as they passed in, into northern Israel, as soon as they start heading towards Dothan for that the last 30 or 40 miles, they're completely exposed, and they really pulled it off. They arrive at Dothan, and they have not stirred the suspicions of the house of Israel. They've got cavalry. They've got chariots. It's obvious that they are a fast-moving force. Verse 15, when the servants of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Dothan is situated in a, in a hilly, hilly country, and it's down on a lower, it's down on a lower section, and all around Dothan, if you're standing in Dothan and you lift up your eyes and you turn 360, you're going to see all around you hill country, high, high ground. And of course, this is battles in those days, battles depend as much on geography as they do on your skill in fighting. And so, the servant gets up and he looks out and lo and behold, they are surrounded. Dothan was not a large city, it was a small town. But they are completely, they are completely surrounded by the Syrians. And it would have been obvious to them, just with the armaments and with the way that they were dressed, it would have been obvious to them that they were up against a Syrian force. It is notable that there's no response whatsoever from Samaria. None whatsoever. And so this seems, the plan seems to be working perfectly. It's a walk in the park. A major expeditionary force comes south. They're moving quickly. They're, they're fast fighters. They're moving quickly. They arrive at the, at the, um, at the objective. They overnight there. When the sun comes up in the morning, they are ready. They're ready to go active. They have the prophet surrounded. Even if they take the prophet and run like wild men, they're going to be able, because they're, they're 10 miles from Samaria, and Samaria is to the south, and they're going to the north, they can take Elisha, and they can move even at a leisurely pace. They can be inside the confines of their own nation with Elisha before Samaria wakes up. So they have got this thing. They've got it in the bag. The servant goes out, and he looks around. What does he see? Trouble. Have you, ever, have you ever woke up and looked out over your life and all you see, the armies of the enemy? It's, a, it's an awful moment, isn't it, when you kind of lift up your eyes and realize, I am in an awful mess. Here's the truth from the Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. This is the truth about walking with God. Things are rarely as they seem more often than not, we are utterly blind to a dimension of power that operates around us. Things are rarely as they seem. When you introduce an involved God who knows the number of the hairs on your head, when you introduce this God into the natural realm, the optics get bent. <laughs> and you're looking at the situation and you're not seeing it clearly. Everything is out of focus. And all we need is God just to step into the midst of that situation and touch us, open our eyes, straighten out the optics, help us to see into a completely different dimension. That's what he does. That's what he does. With God, all things are possible. With God, the natural must bow. It must bow to the supernatural. Elisha's immediate response to his young servant is, fear not. And then that wonderful prayer, Lord, open his eyes that he might see. Open his eyes that he might see. I'll depart here for just a little bit of speculation. Well, it's a little more than speculation, but we are 
even now, surrounded by angelic beings. We are in the midst of a spiritual struggle. If we could see beyond the simple dimensions that are available to us with the naked eye, even with the natural mind, with our knowledge and our view and what we see in the world, if suddenly the Lord were to open up for us a vision into the spiritual dimension, it would absolutely stun us. It would stun us to see exactly what is going on all around us each and every day. The Bible says he, he gives his angels charge concerning us. You've lived a blessed life and you don't even know it. Been a Christian all of these years and lived with somewhat of a blindness to the dimensions that God moves in by his spirit. If you've just been flo you've been living a blessed life, you didn't even know it. You have absolutely no idea how often he has intervened in your stead. I ride a bicycle on these roads in traffic. Let me tell you, I believe in angelic protection. I don't, I don't court disaster and I don't go seeking after foolishness. Neither am I presumptuous, but I do know this. I know that there are angels watching over me. I hesitate to tell this story because I'm absolutely not certain that I've told it to Sherry. I was riding with two guys. It was about, I would say, a year ago. One of the guys is a, is a local racer, super, super strong rider, and... Um, very, very experienced, has ridden many more thousand miles than I've ever thought of, and, uh, and another guy that had come along with him. So I, I didn't know the other guy at all. I knew Tommy, and so, as a matter of fact, Tommy was sitting right there in worship about two weeks, three weeks ago. Tickles me to death. And so I'm out riding with Tommy and, and this, this other guy, and we're flying down the road, and just having a great old time, enjoying ourselves. And we were, being, we were being safe, as, as cyclists should be. We were riding over at the far right edge of the road. And uh, there was a truck that came up behind us, a, a pickup. It's always the pickups. With dualies, you know, a big wide pickup with, with pipes out the top and, and everything else. And um, the, the type of truck where you expect that tobacco is going to be spit out the side window at any moment. So we're, we're rolling along, and, and he comes up behind us, and, and he revs his engine a little bit. We can tell he's a little bit annoyed. We pull over as tightly as we can, uh, and there's plenty of opportunity for him to go around us, and he just delays, and he delays, and he delays, and he delays, and it's, it's like, what is this guy doing back here? And at the last minute, on a bend, the very worst place that he possibly could have chosen he guns it, obviously gets, gets aggravated enough to where he guns it and goes flying around us, goes far to the outside. I mean, almost the, almost the other ditch. And just as he does, a car pops up out of, the, out of the drop just in front of him, coming towards him, swerves right to try and avoid him. The truck goes hard right, almost clips us, goes into the ditch, comes out of the ditch, goes on down the road, laying on his horn, this type of thing. But the car that had gone into the ditch a little bit on this side pops up out of the ditch, does about a 360 through the middle of the road, into the other ditch, comes up out of the ditch and spins halfway again and stops sideways in the road. Did I tell you this story? I didn't think I did. <laughs> I didn't think I did. Anyways. We stopped. You know, I, I stopped, and the first thing out of my mouth was thanks to the Lord. The other guys had other things coming out of their, their mouth. <laughs> I thought somebody better praise him. <laughs> uh, we're standing there for a moment, kind of, kind of shaken, and um, wheeled the bikes around and went back, and this poor guy and his, and his wife and a little Toyota sitting in the middle of the road. There's, he's still holding the wheel like this, wondering how... I do not know how in the world one well, that Toyota kept from flipping over. If you could have seen it go into and come out of the ditches the, the way it was spinning. And aside from all of that, I don't know how the truck or the car missed us. Sherry, it was very much like that situation in the Honda down here at Allerton Place where it was, it was so bad. We both, I think, closed our eyes. And all of a sudden, we 
we, we were th through. I mean, a car turned at that moment where you already programmed the, it, it was going to be a head on. It was, we were done. I believe without a moment's hesitation that we had angels watching over us. And that he in that moment just decided to show us his grace. I think he decided to show me out on the road that day with Tommy and his friend just his grace to us. Just his grace. We have no idea, no idea how they watch out over us. Spiritual warfare is a very real thing, and for the most part, our eyes are somewhat close to it. It's only as we, it's only as we begin to, to pray and move in faith and, and listen for the voice of the Spirit that we begin to even engage in or have any understanding or even a, even a sense of what's going on around us at all times. I was grappling a few years ago, I was grappling with a nagging problem, one that had no simple solution, and it was, uh, it was keeping me up. It was causing a lot of distraction. It was troubling my soul, and it was affecting the life of the church. I sat down on a Tuesday morning with my accountability partner, and I don't like to complain. And uh, we, don't, we try and not fill those times with whining and that kind of thing, but I said, I, I just need to tell you what I'm grappling with. And so he said, shoot. And so I did. I unpacked the bus. I laid, I laid out all of the, the details and as best I could see everything that was happening and here's what I'm dealing with. And, and I, was looking for, I was looking for the fellowship of suffering that comes with sharing your heart with a fellow pastor. And I was, I was looking for confirmation of what I was feeling as far as next steps and perspective. And I, I, really, I really was looking for all of that. I'd been through about 18 months of real mess, and my friend just sat there, sat there quietly and listened to everything, listened to everything that I said, this pastor friend. And when I was done, he leaned forward, and I'll never forget, he leaned forward across the table and quietly. He said, um, first of all, I want you to know that what I'm saying to you, this is the Lord. He said, if I've ever had a prophetic moment in my life, I know that I know that this is one of those moments, and I need to tell you, you've laid this whole thing out, and he said, I, I want to tell you that be, strip the top away on this whole thing and get to the base of it. At its very core, this is first and foremost, this is demonic. Now, I, I was having a problem. I was dealing with the situation. I've dealt with a lot of people in a lot of situations and a lot of church problems, and I've dealt with, with division and dissension and gossip, and I've dealt with all kinds of back, backstabbing, you name it. I've dealt with all of those things before, and it's part, of, part and parcel of just dealing with public life. I'm rolling along, and this guy looks at the whole layout and the situation, and the moment he spoke it, I had that confirmation in my spirit. Listen to this man, because God is speaking to you. He said, this is demonic. And he had about four or five things to say after that that were just bang, 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 bang. And I sat there at the table with my jaw kind of on my chest because suddenly I saw the layout of the whole deal. I saw all of the dynamics, all of the interactions, all of the repercussions. I saw the whole thing with clarity that I had never seen before. I had one of those moments where somebody spoke prophetically, Lord, open his eyes. And so when I read this story in the Old Testament, I don't see it as something that happened 2,700 years ago. I see it as part and parcel of the way that God, the Holy Spirit, deals in our lives as we open ourselves up to Him and as we trust in the gifts that He has entrusted to the body of Christ. Gehazi saw things as they truly were. He saw, in that moment, he saw horses and chariots of fire that surrounded Elijah. Elisha. He saw horses and chariots of fire. Can you imagine what a scene that must have been? I mean, for me, it was pretty dramatic in Panera that day when, when I saw the whole circumstance for what it really was, but I didn't have the visual that this guy did. You imagine you're looking up one minute and you see an, an army encamped against you. You close your eyes for a moment, you open again, and you are literally surrounded by flaming horses and chariots, and they're not facing you to attack you. They're facing out. They're protecting you. Man, that had to be a pretty good moment. That's just my opinion. Wouldn't you say good? That's a good Monday, isn't it? Yeah. 
Every pastor needs that vision on Monday. And when the Syrians came down against him, verse 18, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. I'm going to pause for a moment. This stuns me. I can't, can't go 100% on this one, okay? This is an 80%er for me. It seems to me that God was willing in that moment to do whatever Elisha asked. He sends horses and chariots that are flames of fire, and it seems to me that that means the horses and chariots of fire are going to go encounter the horses and chariots of Ben-Hadad, and Elisha says, here's what I'd like to see God done, and God says, okay. Okay, it's like the division of the loaves and fishes. There's an interesting little thing in there where he asks, what do you have? What would you have me do? The Scripture says also in the loaves and fishes, it says, for he already knew what he would do. Some have read that saying, well, Jesus knew what he was going to do with the loaves and fishes. I'm not so sure that Jesus wasn't ready to do anything that they asked him to do if they'd asked in faith in that moment. Just a thought, like I say, an 80 percenter for me. It might only be 50-50 for you. But when I, look at, when I look at this, and you've got horses and chariots of fire and everything else, and Elisha says, oh, ah, blind them. Blind them. What's blinding got to do with chariots of fire? I mean, it's a completely different, it's just a completely different animal. He steps in and says, please strike this people with blindness. So, in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And then Elisha said to them, they're blind. Can you imagine what blindness would have meant? Well, it, what it would mean to any army, but especially in those days, the rudimentary fundamental weapons that they have, the way that they do warfare, if suddenly you're an army and you're fighting blind, you have no hope, you are done. You can't take your next step. Your only course of action is to pull your sword out and just start swinging it wildly, and chances are you're going to kill all your own guys before you get one of the enemy because you're blind. You've got no strategy at all. It was brilliant. Strike them with blindness, and so they're blind. And Elisha seems to already have a sense of what he's going to do with this whole thing. And he's a spirit-led man, so God is just, he's, he's got his hand on all of this. Elisha says to probably the commander of the army, he said, boys, this is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me. I'll bring you to the man you seek. A little bit of deception here. And so he takes them on a walk, and he leads them to Samaria. He leads them to the capital city of of their arch enemy. He leads them to the most fortified, well-defended, army-populated city in all of Israel. And he marches these blind men through the gate. I've imagined myself as a sentry on the walls of Samaria, watching the road that I watched during my shift. I know everything that's going to come up that road. I know what it is to see a single ox cart, and I know the farmers in the area who come in on certain days to sell their... I know exactly what's going to come up that road. I know when the patrols are coming in and when they're going out, and if they come home, I recognize them from a great distance. But I see something that I just can't figure out. I see that's got to be Elisha. He's an odd-looking duck. If he dressed anything like Elijah, he was. You've got, it looks like Elisha, and he's, he's walking at the head of an army, but those soldiers aren't clothed like our soldiers. It wouldn't take you long. If you're, if you're a sentry on the gate of Samaria, you have to be able to tell them what kind of soldier it is. That's a Syrian soldier. That's a Syrian army. And wait behind, there's horses and chariots, and people are, are, are bringing those horses and chariots along. Elisha is bringing in a Syrian army. In that moment, I think you would shake yourself to make sure you were awake because you come down off that wall and you report this to the, to the king. 
you better know what you're talking about. For Joram, the king of Israel, he can hardly believe his eyes. As he looks out in the courtyard, here comes Elisha, and he marches all of the army, and he has them stop, and here is a large contingent, a strong, large contingent, fast-fighting contingent, the horses, the chariots, the cavalry, here they are standing in the courtyard who don't seem to have a clue as to where they are. And they are completely surrounded now because the moment the word got out that Elisha is bringing in the Syrian army, the moment that the word came out, you better believe that every soldier who was able to carry a sword or a shield in all of Samaria was front and center in that courtyard, shoulder to shoulder, shield to shield, and when the, Samar or when, the, when the Syrian eyes were open, in that moment, what did they see? They saw themselves completely surrounded. There was no point in fighting if they still had their weapons. There was no point in fighting. Can you imagine how confusing it must have been for them? As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. This is a wonderful thought. Just throwing it out there, but it's a wonderful thought. Just as the Lord is able to open our eyes and help us see the reality of the spiritual realm, he is also able to open the eyes of those whose eyes have been blinded to the gospel, it says in Corinthians, their eyes have been blinded. He's able to open their eyes that they can see also what's happening within that spiritual realm. It's a wonderful thing when God causes the scales to fall off people's eyes and suddenly they see Jesus. As soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Here you get a sense of Joram, this evil king, Who's also, who's also taken it on the ear a few times because of this prophet. Here you get a sense of his utter respect. He might not like him, but he has to respect the power of Elisha. He calls him my father. My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? And Elisha answered, you shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you'd taken captive with your sword or with your bow? set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And so he prepared for them a great feast. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And the Syrians did not come again on raids, that's important, on raids into the land of Israel. So Joram, the king of Israel, realizes that the prophet is in complete control here, and he wonders, should I not kill them all? As best we can tell, there is no declared war in the land. Ben-Hadad's army has crossed the boundaries. It's an act of war, but there's been no Israeli blood spilt whatsoever. This battle is obvious. The Lord's is obviously the Lord's, and God shows himself to be a God of mercy. Soldiers taken in battle, by the way, were, were often, most often, they were not killed. It was, it was always a state of atrocity, or it was the ultimate judgment of God when soldiers would be just put to death. Summarily, uh, they would be, they would be uh, sentenced and put to death on the spot. Generally, they were taken captive. They were exchanged at points in, in diplomatic exchanges, or they became slaves and that kind of thing. But they were generally not put to death. These men hadn't been in battle with anyone. This was a failed attempt by Ben-Hadad against Elisha. And God said, I'm going to show you mercy. And so they fed them, and they sent them home. It says food and water was set before them, but it goes further. It says he pre they prepared a great feast and sent them away. When you had your enemy in your hand, and you served him a, a meal in Middle Eastern culture, if he sat and ate a meal with you, it was tantamount to a peace treaty. When you had showed him mercy and then you had broken bread with him, it was tantamount to showing the greatest, the very greatest of goodwill. And this would have put Ben Hadad in a very awkward diplomatic position. The army would report back to Ben Hadad that through the supernatural intervention of this prophet, obviously the God of Israel was still in a position of great strength. 
They would tell of the hospitality of the king of Israel, how he had fed them with a great feast before he had sent them back, and Ben-Hadad would have been obliged to step back from all of his incitements. Thus, the Scripture says that there was no more raiding. This does not preclude what we're going to see as we move forward next week. This does not preclude an invasion that comes later as Ben-Hadad comes down and besieges Samaria. That's an out-and-out act of war. But the raiding, the border conflict that was incited always by Ben-Hadad as he was looking for points of weakness, it stopped. It stopped. Ben-Hadad's frustration must have been greatly intensified. But for, the period of, for this period of time, and we don't know exactly where it falls in the chronology. Absent the chronology, we can't set these events. But for a period of time, there's peace and rest. This also at the hand of the Lord. Ben Hadad is not again seen in Israel until he launches an all-out attack against Samaria. And once again, you're going to find King Joram in Israel, Elisha the prophet, Ben Hadad as the aggressor, and God's miraculous intervention. But it will move us forward in the storyline as Aram becomes a stronger and stronger power which will ultimately set the door open for a greater power further to the north to come sweeping in and to change the whole uh, fabric of, of the house of Israel. But looking into this story, we've gone just a little bit further, and I think we've got an awareness now of who Syria is and Ben Hadad. We've got the players on the stage. Next week, we'll take it just a little bit further.